recording. All attendees are in listen only mode. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for our webinar. Uh, this is a lesson learned series, and the title is Vandalism of Art in Public Spaces. I want to thank our partners, Visit Florida and um, Culture Bills Florida, the Florida Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs for their support. And I, okay. I just want to let you know that um, the FAM staff here today with you um, are Melinda Horton, our FAM Executive Director, and I want to invite her to say a few words if she'd like to. Hi everybody, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to listen to the webinar. I hope you're all um, doing well, staying safe. Um, that's what we are doing. We're trying to all work remotely in our offices away from people. So I hope that things are going well and I look forward to hopefully seeing all of you one day, not in the too far future. So thank you for coming into this. If you have any feedback or any comments, when it's over with, please feel free to email myself or Carmen. We're happy to, to take any questions or to also um, provide any input. Or if you have ideas of other webinars you would like to see offered, we'd love to hear those. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Melinda. Um, just a few housekeeping items. First of all, the webinar is going to be recorded today. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to use the chat box. Um, you can ask those questions as they come up in your mind so we don't lose them. And then I'll make sure to moderate those at the end. Um, and then finally, we do have a survey that will be going out. Uh, we appreciate it if you would fill that out. It will only take a couple minutes, um, but it does help us understand sort of like what you thought about this particular program, but also um, help us determine what programs to provide in the future. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Rosa Lowinger is the CEO and Chief Conservator of RLA Conservation of Art Plus Architecture. They have offices in Miami and Los Angeles, and they do a lot of work for me, both museums and private collectors uh, throughout the United States. Rosa has a great deal of experience and expertise in this area. We are super excited to have her here today to share this with us, this information. Um, and I am going to um, quickly share the screen, uh, her screen with you. So just give me a quick second to do that. So let's see, are you guys? I can see your screen. Can you? Very good. And you can hear me? Yes, you sound great. Terrific. Thank you very much. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here um, virtually in Florida. Um, I'm here. I'm in Los Angeles where I have a second home. And um, I want to begin this presentation with a, um, an acknowledgement that I am speaking to you from the unceded land of the Tongva and Chumash peoples. And I'm honored today to have the opportunity to acknowledge the Tongva and Chumash communities and pay respect to their past, present, and future elders. My presentation today focuses on our current urgent need to address monuments that have a racist or offensive connotation or meaning and how vandalism plays into that. I'm not here to weigh in on what constitutes a racist monument, but to discuss the trajectory of vandalism as a natural response to what's a centuries old uh, dialogue with cultural. I base this presentation on work I did when I was the 2008-2009 Rome Prize Fellow in Conservation at the American Academy in Rome. And my project there was titled A Brief History of Vandalism, focusing on how different roles of unauthorized interventions into works of public art or public space are different and similar to, different from and similar to each other. Um, 
I value very much beginning this particular presentation with a land acknowledgement because if we're going to talk about the unauthorized intervention into public land and public space, it seems fair to begin by laying on the table that ownership of public space and public art is a changing concept, a bit of a palimpsest, and that's part of what this presentation will address. So I'm, I want to begin with um, a building that many of you here know called the Miami Marine State, which is a um, an important monument, monument, excuse me, uh, an important uh, modernist artwork uh, building in Miami. It's a building that my firm and I have worked on for many years, and it serves as a kind of case study about how uh, interventions of an unauthorized sort could change the character of a monument or a work of art. And this building, though it is a building that was designed as the first purpose-driven um, designated <laughs> space to support a speedboat racing, has gone through a lot of changes over time. This is how the building looked originally when it was built in 1963 designed by a recently arrived Cuban-American architect named Hilario Candela, who had studied with uh, many great architects at Georgia Tech and in Havana. And when he arrived at the city um, of Miami in the 1960s, he was tasked with building this stadium because Miami was then just becoming an important center for the sport, sport of speedboat racing. And this place became a speedboat racing venue and also a concert venue that was um, you know, I'm sure that many of you listening today could say, oh, yeah, I was at that famous Jimmy Buffett concert or Steppenwolf or Cab Calloway because dozens of important performers played there. However, one of the things that uh, happened, and this won't seem strange to anybody, is that the city of Miami was not able to properly monetize or run the building profitably. So they decided to allow it to deteriorate and um they wanted it to be knocked down and Hurricane Andrew in 1992 gave them the perfect opportunity to call for the building's demolition. The problem was the FEMA money that they got for the purpose of demolishing the stadium um, required that an engineering study be done to determine whether the building really needed demolishing and the building was so solidly built. University of Florida um, uh, engineer, um, uh, who designed the roof, the cantilevered roof with re with reinforced, with galvanized rebar. And that's why the building was so strong that they that FEMA had to take back the money because um, they, there was no reason to, to demolish this building. So what the city of Miami did is they decided to allow it to fall apart by what is typically called in the field of preservation, demolition by neglect. Just letting the building languish, allowing the fire department to use it as a uh, test ground for spraying with their high-powered hoses seawater at it, but the building did not collapse. However, in the late 1990s, it was discovered by the graffiti community. You have these wide, beautiful expanses of concrete with nothing on them, and the building has become, in the years since, a widely known international venue for street art and graffiti. And these are just a few of the images. If you Google online graffiti Miami Marine Stadium, which I invite you to do, you will see literally thousands of images. And there's also lots of images of young people staging music videos and quinceanera photo shoots. And there's a fantastic parkour um, performance on the stadium as well. So what, but what, so what that means is in the, in the, in the mid 2000s, when a, a movement was developed to save the building from neglect and demolition, you have, you had two distinct um, eras of stakeholders. You had the individuals who from 1963 to the say 1990-ish saw it as a, um, a sports and concert venue and then everybody since then, which is essentially all of its future stakeholders who knew it to be a graffiti venue and a street art venue. And with the advent of Art Basel and Miami as an international arts venue and the Windwood Walls, this became a very important component of this building. What's interesting about it is that the architect whom you see in the lower right hand photo in the gray suit with the tie, Hilario Candela, and to his uh, I guess it's his right, is 
Jorge Hernandez, professor of architecture at the University of Miami, who were two of the three people who, who, um, who started Fred Miami Marine Stadium. The architect was not upset about the graffiti because what he said in, um, in, a, in a workshop that we held as part of a Getty grant for the building, he said, look, these young people kept my building alive. The city wanted my building to collapse. These young people came, kept it alive. They adapted it and adopted it and gave it relevance. So during the time when the building now, this is now, that the building is being considered um, for renovation and the city has poured some money and the state has given money toward developing the construction plans for renovation. One of the things that we did, my firm did as part of a Getty grant that we received for the building was to hold a charrette with the, with developers, with the city, with the graffiti community, with preservationists and with the architect himself to talk about how we parse out this palimpsest of what this building was because it really has been two different things. It doesn't really quite matter what it was designed to be to begin with. What it became superseded it at a certain point. And what happened was something very interesting. You had the graffiti community pretty much saying, look, if the city takes care of this building that we consider a grand work of art, then hands off, we're, 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 not, gonna, we're not gonna touch it. But if you leave it there and you leave it to languish, then it's ours. And so the architect actually wanted to see certain aspects of the building left in place for the graffiti community to continue to be able to tag it. It's not clear that that's gonna fly in the new plan. And as part of the new plan, one of the things that has to be done is graffiti has to be removed for the purpose of removing salts from the building and making the proper repairs because it's an unpainted building. So in order to do repairs that are aesthetically correct, you have to take the graffiti off to, to do them. But what you, what the reason I like to begin with this is because it shows you how these um, concepts of vandalism and unauthorized interventions sometimes transform a site entirely and they become heritage themselves. In this case, we're in a gray area with the building. It could easily go either way. And you have the original creator coming to terms with what was done with this building as a positive thing. So now this segues into what's going on today. What you see on the screen is a Confederate monument on the left and a statue of Christopher Columbus on the right. And you see a different type of approach to these pieces. Um, and these can be polemical positions. Um, what I would like to talk about today is the fact that certain objects change over time and their content changes over time and how they are impacted sometimes becomes part of the story of their own heritage in the same way that the graffiti on the marine stadium became part of its heritage and what i want to say also is that sometimes you know with um i'm, I'm going to try to avoid value judgment but my 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 personal values are going to certainly come out in here because this is a moment where it's kind of hard to be neutral but it is also a moment where we have to kind of be honest to our own feelings about these things and what we think about them and as and as preservation professionals i literally right before this workshop this webinar i was on the phone with the committee for the American Institute of Conservation that is defining what our position is as a group of people that stewards heritage, um, what our position is on Confederate monuments and contested monuments in general, and I'll be happy to answer questions about that. So let me put on my conservator hat to talk to you a little bit about the research I did in Rome and about vandalism as a concept. Vandalism can mean many things to many people. And in my study on the history of vandalism, I've embraced the term. I don't think we need another term. Some people think it's a bad word, but I don't think so. Vandalism in my definition is an act involving a deliberate act of destruction or damage, but we can call it an unauthorized impact to a public or a private property. Um, on the screen, 
you see a very interesting mural, which is a mural from the year 1160, located in Subiaco, Italy, about 20 miles north of Rome, in the monastery where St. Benedict saw his vision. And this mural, as you can probably tell, has been gouged, scratched, and, and, and graffitied permanently by hundreds of years, centuries of pilgrims that have gone to the site. And the very idea that one's impact on a mural would be to gouge into it as an act of reverence is something that really would kind of be unthinkable within our terms as stewards of public art within the United States. However, as a conservator, when I look at this mural and I think about its heritage value, there's, you know, there's probably 20,000 murals of the Virgin Mary in Italy, but to see one that has the historical um, footprint of so much traffic and so much veneration is a different story. And you would never really consider removing any of this as part of its conservation. For the same reason, no one would ever consider removing graffiti from the walls of Pompeii. We know what people who were not in power thought at Pompeii because of these words of theirs that are written on the walls of the city. And as you can see from some of these um, translations that were done by a colleague of mine at the American Academy in Rome, some of this is not really, uh, some, of, some of this is pretty colorful, but these are the words of prostitutes, of slaves, of low class, uh, of people that did not own property that were of lower classes. And our historical knowledge of these people comes entirely from these unauthorized interventions into the walls of Pompeii. But now let's take it the other way about unauthorized interventions, because, you know, obviously my, in my showing images such as these and the first images that I showed, um, I, do, I do bear some sympathy to people who wish to intervene. But I also recognize that that's a double-edged sword because, for example, these two pieces on the left is a sculpture of uh, a monument to Arthur Ashe in Richmond, Virginia, that was vandalized during the recent protests with the um, initials WLM, White Lives Matter. And on top of that, the, um, the, the Black Lives Matter initials. And similarly on the right is a detail of a bronze sculpture of one of the Korean comfort women that were enslaved by the Japanese army during World War II. Um, these are sculptures that Korean embassies and the Korean government commissions and installs in many places around the world. In uh, Seoul, it's the, the, uh, there's a piece of this nature outside of the Japanese embassy. And the Japanese vehemently um, uh, deny the fact that Korean women were enslaved for prostitution. And it's been a source of enormous uh, political contention between the two nations. And these sculptures are vandalized all the time. And you have many, uh, they're vandalized typically by Japanese perpetrators and they are restored by Koreans, often women who wish to see this, um, this monu these monuments kept and maintained. Vandalism is always a problem for outdoor collections, whether or not it's culturally controversial. This is a sculpture by the artist Robert Graham in California. And it's interesting, when I first used this as an image in, this, in a series of lectures, I didn't think of this as a politically or societally driven vandalism. I thought of it as just a tag, but when you revisit it and look at it again, it does have a, a connotation that is offensive and political um, and misogynist, if you will. But um, the fact is we deal with this all the time. Now on a bronze sculpture such as this, it's not that big a deal because bronzes are typically waxed. So if you're maintaining your sculpture properly and putting good coats of wax on the surface, Red paint should be like almost a no brainer to remove, but that's not always the case. Um, but when you think about the other, the other thing I wanted to say at the outset is that one person's venerated image is another person's um, uh, 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 tyrant. 
So here you have an, a mural, a, a, a sculptural mural that is very famous. It was installed dur uh, after the Cuban Revolution in Havana on a historic 1950s administrative building. It's the uh, portrait of Che Guevara. And for those of you who know Cuban Americans, and I am one of them, Che Guevara is not an individual who we consider a hero. We consider him a tyrant. We consider him the author of the um, the summary execution squads that took place in early 1960s Cuba, the expropriation of all private property. He was the architect of that. And yet, young people wear Che Guevara t-shirts all the time. And people on the left think of Che Guevara as a great hero because he represents a political point of view that is supposedly anti-imperialist. So what I mean, what I'm saying by this is this is a monument that right now exists. And if there's any sort of political change in Cuba, will likely cease to exist because these things are the type of images that come and go as part of the natural progression of how people view culture and heritage. So in my work in Rome, I defined vandalism in three different ways. I kind of gave some thought to how do you unpack these interventions? And the way I um, came up with the intervention, the, the, um, the definitions are fundamentally this. The first is an intervention that is iconoclastic or socio-political in its intent. Um, that is something that is, it can be spontaneous and unpredictable, or it could be, um, it could be, you know, state sanctioned, and I'm going to show uh, samples of that. There's usually an intention, malice might not be the right word, but it's sort of a deliberate destructiveness is intentional. The second is what we see all the time, graffiti tagging, a kind of contemporary street art dialogue, which is like the Miami Marine Stadium, where you have um, uh, usually, usually youthful um, interventions that are not intended to represent a political point of view for it necessarily. They're pretty spontaneous. They're not premeditated. Or if they are, the intention is something more aesthetic than political or, um, or religious. And then I just note this because it's, it's, it's an interesting aspect of some acts of vandalism that works of um, art and public space and monuments are potent and powerful for a reason. And they do attract um, a response sometimes for people who have mental health issues. And I'm going to show those as well. But they're not really something that we can kind of codify or think about in any um, structural way because they respond to some other type of um, call, if you will. So I want to start by talking about these iconoclastic and political statements. And primarily think about um, um, the fact that historically we um, have always toppled things that are unpopular. And what I wanted to, oh, and by the way, um, what, where I want to go back, I want to go back to something in my in my previous slide. But I'll, I'll keep this. Up, but what I want to just say is one thing: when we're talking about vandalism, there's one key definition. It is an unauthorized, that is an, an intervention that is intentional. It's never unintentional. It's not accidental. It's not, um, for example, if you damage a work of art because a, a, if a skateboarder damages a work of art, that's not vandalism. That's, that's accidental damage because of vandalism. If Steve Wynn puts his elbow through his Picasso by accident, that's different than a painting being slashed. The, to me, the definition is that it is intentional. The message can be big or small. It could be aggressive or playful. But the unified concept is that it is an unauthorized, permanent, or semi-permanent intentional alteration. And I come to this topic. Uh, I just thought I'd mention it here also. I come to this topic because as a conservator who works on public art, and I often deal with agencies on installing public art, what we find ourselves and my colleagues and I always find ourselves very much that the dialogue about public art is that we're often thinking about how to protect it from the very public that it is intended to serve. So that's why I started to think about this. And, you know, that's how it, excuse me, expanded outward into this broader dialogue. So what you see here 
are two traditional iconoclastic political interventions into public sculptures. On the right, the toppling of a dictator. This is something we see all over the world. And these are deliberate um, actions to designate a type of political change. But they are also ancient um, there are ancient precedents for this as well. These large Roman monuments like the Arch of Septimus Severus in Rome that you see all over uh, Rome were too big for anyone to topple and they cost too much money and too many generations of, of usually slaves building them to topple them. But what was typically done by one emperor who superseded another usually by killing them is that they would gouge out the names of the previous emperor gouge out in his image and add new information to it. So it's a kind of state sanctioned vandalism to, des to designate a change in regime. A different type of this kind of iconoclastic or political damage is much more uh, virulent and much more um, uh, uh, violent would be the the act of um i can the, the 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 type of political or religious aggression that accompanies war or uh, um or or a, a a more um sort of um what's the word Ag aggression is really the word and the the three acts that i show here are the 1993 um toppling of the most star bridge during the uh, croatian bosnian war now, up on the right is uh, the the uh, destruction of the Berlin synagogue during Kristallnacht and the destruction in 2002 or three of the Bamiyan Buddhas by the Taliban. These are three acts of extreme political iconoclastic and religious aggression that are deigned necessary for destruction with the, the the intention of them is to cause harm to a population examples of this with a less um you know more with, with some more and some less um aggressive intent are on this screen the two images on the left the toppling of a sculpture of joseph stalin and the toppling of a confederate soldier statue in recent years the intent of this is to show we are not anymore in agreement with this belief system we are going to topple something to show our disagreement with that ideology what you see on the right though is of a different nature it's similar but of a different nature um the the image that's being held in the postcard is of the his ancient city of palmyra before destruction by isis and the image behind it is um, Palmyra as it exists today. And that was an aggressive act more akin to the ones that we saw on the previous page, uh, in, the, in the previous slide, where there's an, there's an act of aggression that is intended not to make a statement that is um, measured, but to really destroy something to the level where no one can recapture it again. And to show, um, because, for example, there's no ideology expressed in this image. Palmyra isn't an ideal. Palmyra is a historical location. And to destroy it the way ISIS did, and they did with so many ancient cities, as they um, kind of uh, ran roughshod across the Middle East, was to sort of really thumb their noses at the whole nature of history. And that's akin to what the Khmer Rouge did in Cambodia during the years of their power. So to that end, the, to that end, by showing these differences in, 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 in degree, if you will, of the way things are destroyed, this is an act of destruction that took place recently um, in, in downtown Los Angeles, where Junipero Serra, who was one of the, uh, the, the chief um, uh, Catholic Spanish friar who settled the missions of California, but was known for acts of extreme violence against the native populations was toppled in downtown LA, but in an incredibly ritualistic ma manner. For example, it wasn't just a an angry mob that walked in and tore it down. There was a ritual, there were people in, in, in native garb, there were speeches and ceremonies, and as you can see, there are flowers on the back of the sculpture. The point being that the way you do things has an impact and this is where 
the palimpsest of history takes place because, for example, this statue is one of thousands in California, but this act that has been perpetrated upon it, and in this manner specifically, speaks to its history, and that the documentation of that particular act of destruction is a layer onto its meaning. Other ways in which these kinds of um, changes to heritage can be um, affect, uh, impacted is shown in this example from the Dominican Republic of murals that were done in the 1960s with the, um, the, the dictator Trujillo. And when there was a regime change and that most violent dictator was, was uh, deposed, he or he his his image was blacked out instead of covering over the murals entirely and i know we have so many contested murals going on right now especially wpa images that show native populations or african americans in a light that is um um, um offensive removing the image altogether removing the image of the offender or the offendee is um is an appropriate response. And I also like to show this image by my that was given to me by my colleague Viviana Dominguez because you see two different types of change to this mural here. The, the scratching on the bottom of it is not that is full damage because this these were murals in the school and those were the chairs of children uh, scratched the bottom of the mural. That isn't considered vandalism. That's really a different kind of damage, but the blocking out of the face is a different story. And I um, I want to close out this um, portion where I talk about um, the definition of vandalism as in, in, a classic, in its iconoclastic or religious or political point of view by showing some of the incredible things that the suffragettes did to work in art in public space. They burned the tea garden. The, the the tea house at Kew Garden um, in 1914. And they, this on the right is the exquisite uh, painting by Velasquez of the Roca B. Venus that the suffragette Mary Richardson slashed in 1914 to pro uh, protest the jailing of another suffragette. Um, so I like to show these images because the, no one argues right now, we're celebrating the 100th year of the women's right to vote in the United States. No one argues that that was a good decision, and yet it was it was greatly contested at the time, and people were extremely angry at the suffragettes, and they were jailing them and refusing to listen to that voice, and it took some acts of political violence um, against works of art to make the point. I'm going to take a breath and a drink of water for one second before I continue. The next definition that I use in my discussion of vandalism is this um, concept of a contemporary street art dialogue where people tag things because they're there, because it's a canvas, because they want to make a mark on a public or space to just show their, their voice. Um, I'm not, again, saying this is right or wrong. This on the right is a, um, column that was part of an installation that is part of an installation on the Los Angeles transit system that runs from downtown LA to Pasadena. And this is a column. You can see it's still wrapped at the bottom. There's still cones. The station had not even been opened yet when already they were tagging the, the column. And this is one of the reasons why as conservators of public art, we're always trying to think about what materials will withstand those types of intervention. Um, and on the left, the sculpture you see is a one of many, many marble busts in a park in Rome called the Pincho that is situated above the Spanish steps. It's a beautiful park that has maybe several dozen of these marble uh, sculptures to various Italian figures, some literary, some political, most, it would be like, you know, having a random congressman from 1970 portrayed in marble bus, pretty much white guys that mean nothing to anybody. And so what young people have done is that the, these pieces are tagged repeatedly, usually with magic marker for some reason. Um, 
it's always kind of, you know, just silly stuff like you see here. And they, it goes on for a while and then it's removed. But the question is, all right, so I, I, is it right or wrong? I don't know. Because again, some people don't want to see it. But on the other hand, some people don't want to see an entire park full of these busts that mean nothing to anybody. They kind of derive a meaning for a younger generation by the tagging that's on them. And I know people will argue with me about that. I, I welcome the discussion. So, but part as part of that, graffiti of that nature, where you just tag a name or words onto something is a longstanding historical document. And when we are able to travel as Americans again to Europe, when Europe lets us in again, I invite everybody when you're visiting churches, especially in Italy, but really anywhere, to look along the chair the chair rail height, and you will see names scratched in, names drawn in with pencil, from the Church of San Clemente to the um, Cathedral in Siena, these markings are everywhere. And these two that I show here are important ones because, especially the one on the left, that is French graffiti from the soldiers that sacked Rome in the 16th century. Excuse me. And of course, that is a protectable, preservable, piece of graffiti. Now it's, you know, it's four centuries old, but again, that speaks to what's some of the graffiti that's going on now with um, either political or non-political content might mean. This is an example from Los Angeles. This is a mural that was commissioned by the city's public art agency to glorify the history of the Filipino community. And you can see it's been tagged pretty heavily and when um, the conservation team went in to restore the mural, they were confronted by the Filipino gangs who had tagged the mural and said, look, this is our contribution to our own legacy. We, went, we meant no disrespect here. Our, our point of view was you've painted something on a wall. We're painting something on it as well to add to the dialogue about it. So this kind of speaks to the fact that we really have to understand where some of this material comes from. And then some of it is just pure embellishment. The mural that you see on the top, these are these are other walls at the Miami Marine Stadium. And you know, if you ever if you've ever been there, and right now the site is closed to the public, some of these are quite beautiful. And of course, the one of the things about these um, street tags or street murals is that nobody expects them to remain in place. Um, people expect them to either be painted over or to be uh, buffed out or to have another mural painted on top of it. And the images you see below on the left is Rome. On the right, the, that delightful, in my opinion, little alligator mural is in Venice, Italy, which of course we might take some umbrage at because Venice is a city of, you know, a world heritage site, extreme historical heritage. However, it also is a city that has a living population there. And there is a, um, an idea of adding to what is already there. I want to just make a note here, talk about the fact that some of these works are targets of people who have delusional fantasies about them. And to me, this might be one of the most powerful um, concepts because the fact is that if people damage these things because they, if they, if they affect people who have um, issues of mental health, works of art have a power, a visual power, monuments and works of art have a visual power that really impact even people amongst us who are not um, deciding with with uh, exact with all their faculties, a different um, attraction is held for some people by these works of art. And I think that speaks to the power of image and placement. Another um, thing to consider when we're talking about vandalism and uh, public art and public space is what type is it? Is it additive? spray painting, magic marker, stickers, paste ups, or is it something that really destroys a monument? And this speaks to what's going on today as well. Because for example, with additive graffiti, you can always get that off. In almost all cases, 
you have a chance of removing it if you want to. And this is especially important for buildings. Whereas when something is actually destroyed, and I don't mean toppled, I mean destroyed when people talk about melting things down, then you have no chance really to address the history and the future of such a thing. But this is an, a point where, this is a place where I want to um, make one good point, is that in these recent months where we've seen things um, tagged with magic marker and spray paint and whatnot, the worst possible thing that you can do to try to remove that is to send in your crew of uh, power washers to go in and remove it because I more, our firm more often than not deals with the aftermath of a poorly removed graffiti tag than with the tags themselves because once you have somebody power washing that stuff off that doesn't know what the substrate um, can or can't accept there you have a greater chance of actually either etching the surface or driving the pigments in so deep into the pore of something that you'll never get it out. Another thing about the, um, when I earlier showed that image of Che Guevara, this is related to it, where you have one person's offensive monument being another commemorative site. Um, on the left is an, a graffito from downtown Havana, Cuba, that says, Abajo Batista Asesino, down with Batista Assassin that was um, put up in the 1950s when uh, people were fighting the Batista government. And as many of you would know, the current Cuban regime does not allow for any political graffiti that, um, that uh, criticizes them. However, this graffito against the former regime is lovingly restored. So, you know, these, these types of uh, words, though they may seem very small, in the context of a particular political regime or another are very meaningful because it would make sense, you know, if we lived in a perfect world, it would make sense for this type of graffiti to accompany current graffiti against the government, but that's not really what happens. Uh, these, these types of, um, of cries are, are protected depending on what the point of view is. And similarly, um, a monument like the one on the right that, um, that uh, promotes, and I, I don't know the specific monument, so I'm not sure if this specific monument is, is um, has, I, I don't really understand what the, the bronze itself is saying, but can, once it's tagged with Black Lives Matter, let's say it was a monument with a specific uh, contested racial um, point of view, the minute you put Black Lives Matter on it, you change its content entirely. And finally, I want to just say a word or two about the bigger picture of cultural appropriation altogether, which is pretty much the basis of what we're all concerned with nowadays. Cultural appropriation is sort of the, is, is you know, um, on the right, you see Mount Rushmore, which is now hotly contested because it is a uh, monument to people who conquered Native Americans on sacred Native American ground. And that's a pretty powerful thing to do to someone's sacred space. Um, however, if you look at the Pantheon that is uh, from, you know, it was built in 126 AD when Rome was uh, conquered by, you know, the, the Christians, um, all Roman monuments to all Roman deities were transformed into churches. And that's that layering of one history on top of another. So we, we only capture our moment when we're thinking about what is appropriate or not. But if you go back centuries to and, and millennia to what's been done over the, over the years, you'll see that this is really just part of a continuum. So just to say a word about the contextualization. When we contextualize vandalism, we, we understand that it's not a new phenomenon. When we define why we want to protect works of art and, and monuments, we reaffirm the notion that, that these works of public art are important to our landscapes and that they enhance us somehow. Sorry, let me get my uh, all my different things off my screen. Um, 
However, when we're talking about certain things, um, and you know, in, in in these recent discussions that I've been having with my colleagues at the American Institute of Conservation about Confederate statues. I always think of it as like, what would I do? To me, I think of it as a Confederate statue is uh in my is is like a swastika in my and on the corner of Wilshire and Fairfax near where I'm living right now. It's not a monument and it's not a work of art. It's a piece that is fundamentally put there with a point of view of intimidating. So for example, I don't believe sculptures of Christopher Columbus were installed with the idea of intimidating, but sculptures that were installed um, well after the um, Civil War was fought and lost by the Confederacy, um, and that were placed there in promotion of Jim Crow laws or um, or other you know reasons to intimidate the black population, they're not, they, they had a purpose that is really offensive. And then, so their removal really is called for in a different way. And how they're removed impacts the public perception, which is where we conservators come in because what we know how to do is deal with um, uh, tangible heritage. So how you remove something matters. If if your idea, if your if your point is to destroy it and show like the like ISIS um, that we we want to basically crush this notion or the Bamiyan Buddhas, um, we want to crush this ideology, that is a point of view. However, if you want to remove it in a different way um, without fueling the flames of anger, conservators can help with that, with that uh, dialogue. And why am I having trouble doing that? Ah, so I've been compiling some of the discussions on the future of Confederate statues. Um, Obviously, in the center, the leader of the Sons of the Confederate Veterans uh, is, is suing to protect Confederate statues, saying that they're there to honor the dead. Well, that may be true in specific cemetery monuments, but in general, we, 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 I think we've, we've, all, you know, that's, we've all gotten past that idea in terms of monuments that are set up in cities and were placed there long after the Civil War. The city of Baltimore, is taking the approach of wanting to know what is going to be done with those pieces and how they're going to be used. And um, there's been some recent examples of um, African American museums within cities accepting these monuments so that they can contextualize them. They can contextualize them. And then here, um, how they're, the fate of the statues matters less than how they are removed. They shouldn't be done covertly. It should be done like the Junipero Serra sculpture in a public ceremony that that uh, kind of opens the way to new thinking. Again, how you move things matters. And I show this image too, because, you know, there at the beginning of this whole um, uh, advancement of the movement this summer, there were a lot of people online, especially some professors of classics that were showing people how to topple obelisks on their own. And m our point of view as conservators is, folks, this is serious business. Look at this piece, you can get hurt. Um, the idea of having a group of people with ropes trying to topple this on their own is preposterous. You get people killed and people have been hurt by this. So I wanna close with just a couple of images that are about uh, not contested, um, uh, well, they are about contested things, but they're not about Confederate statues. It just shows how perception is part of the discussion that has to take place when you're thinking of things. This is a this was a popular um, piece of public art in the city of Los Angeles, Erica Rothenberg's The Road to Hollywood, which is um, a very mordant tongue in cheek. Um, piece that speaks to the power structures of Hollywood. And it has different examples of how different people got to Hollywood. And at the end, it has this concrete couch as a kind of ironic point of view that people, uh, some people think that people get to Hollywood by sleeping their way to the top and that some people do. The point being that um, the artist was neutral about it. It's just a, it was just a statement that has irony, that has mordant humor built into it. Well, during 
the height of the Me Too movement, people flipped out, suggesting that she was recommending this as a point of view, and the couch was removed, which of course took away the entire meaning of this this artwork. And, and, and to me, what that spoke to is the fact that when you have um, a lot of public opinion, sometimes public opinion does not uh, de deal very much in subtlety, and sometimes artists can be a little bit uh, ahead of the game in terms of these di discussions that and it, they won't fly. This is a great um, um, uh, approach that I've seen lately. This artist, Joy Remy Naya, who describes herself as a Dominican uh, United Statesian artist. Um, she has a series of projects where she creates these fabrics that are like stretchy lycra fabrics using images of plants that were um, that native populations used to either create poison darts or to fortify themselves. And these interventions are wrapping the sculptures that are contested in this in this manner with this, these fabrics that sort of are apparently decoratively neutral, but have a lot of symbolic meaning within them. And to me, this is one of the best um, uh, uh, you know responses to contested statues that I've seen, because for one thing is we're in a moment right now where we don't really know what the future of some of these things are going to be. And we are, we are dealing with some of our thoughts about heritage and some of the permanent solutions may be um, too permanent, if you will. Um, but this is a really great approach, I think, to, you know, if if I had if I ran a public art program and had statues that were contested in it, I would be absolutely um, lobbying to keep them in place and have artists of color intervening in them over and over until a decision can be made unilaterally about what the future should be. Um, another example, this is one that our firm is dealing with right now. This is, you know, the, the when the Berlin Wall came down, um, fragments of the wall were sold around the world and put in commemorative locations as symbols of freedom. Um, and this is a piece that is located in a garden that was created to showcase it at Chapman University in Southern California. And somebody, you know, got the idea of painting over the graffiti, not really understanding that the graffiti was the whole point of the piece. And so the graffiti was painted over and now our job has to be to try to undo that painting over the graffiti, which is um, complicated to say the least. And of course, this, there's this famous um, example where humor is used by a collective called Destructive Creation to uh, paint over the really offensive monument to the Soviet army that was located in Sofia, Bulgaria in 1954 when the Soviets marched into mm -hmm. Bulgaria and they took it over. And these kinds of responses are, I think, very effective. When you neutralize things with humor, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Not everything can be neutralized with humor, but, but some things can be. And so I'll just give you, close with a few things to consider from a public art standpoint. What types of vandalism can you predict and prepare for? Uh, do some attract more vandalism than others? Um, and uh, can some of it uh, be considered part of heritage and some of it be uh, protectable as historical documents? And I want to thank everybody for having me here. I think it's important to close with a beautiful example of how one monument was intervened to showcase a terrible historical act that happened in our country this year. So I can turn it over now to the questions. Thank you so much. Um, as somebody who studies history, that was really interesting. Um, I want to remind you all, um, <clears throat> You can type questions in the box and I can answer them for you. Or if you'd like, um, another option is um, in your control panel, there is like a little hand. And so you can um, raise your hand to ask a question as well. That's another option. Um, 
right now. Can you get rid of my screen? Um, yeah, here, hold on a second. I'll share my screen. Give me just a second. And I, I can you hear me? Um, I noticed the, the dialogue box for the question is not working on my end. I don't know if other people are having that problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I got one question in here. Um, but if you if you do have a question, you can uh, you know go ahead and say say what that is. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you, Rosa, for this presentation. It was really delightful to um, to just hear everything. Um, super interesting. Um, my question is pretty simple, and you've probably had it a lot. What what made you want to focus on graffiti as a uh, as a as a topic of, of research and in focus and and I'm wondering if it does that come from your personal history with uh, with the Cuban government and what happened there and no 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 wait I'll tell you very simply um, as I said somewhere in there you know we I work on public art collections all the time and when you deal with public art you deal a lot with dealing with vandalism we when when people fabricate public art when they think about public art maintenance, vandalism is one of the top things that we consider. And it just started to feel to me like a strange um, idea that we're putting works of art into public spaces and spending a lot of our time thinking about how to protect those works of art from the public that they are intended to serve. So that's one answer. That's, that's really the basis of it. But also, I really wanted the Rome Prize, and I thought this would make a very cool project, and they agreed. <laughs> that's that's great. Um, and then I have one more quick question, and I'll 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 let other people sure, chime and in. Do you mind uh, identifying yourself? Because I'd just like to know who I'm talking to. Oh, this is Tim McMullen. Oh, Tim, please. <laughs> uh, let somebody. <laughs> okay. I'll stop talking. All right. Uh, does anybody else have a question? You can, uh, I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. If you can unmute yourself, go ahead and do that um, to ask a question, or you can raise your hand um, in the control panel. Um, the, the only question I had was during the program, Rosa, and it was a specific question about one of the pieces of art that they couldn't make out um, the phrase that was tagged on the Che building. That was just something somebody asked. Oh, oh, that wasn't tagged. That was uh, part of the mural itself, part of the bronze. Okay, what did that did say? You know, it says it said "Hasta la Victoria siempre," which is the um, the the slogan of the Castro government or the Cuban communist government. Uh, to victory always, and that was uh, you know Che Guevara's motto. So that wasn't a tag. That's not a tag. That is a bronze in, or painted steel um, relief sculpture that is attached to a historic building. Okay, great. Um, anybody else have any questions? Um, you know, feel free to to ask because you know I know that you know there's there's no there's no dumb questions. <laughs> Um, and we're all in this together, and so please, you know, feel free to. If nobody else has one, Tim, go ahead again. All right, thank you. I do have another question. This is Tim McMullen. Um, it, I was really interested where they uh, where they blacked out the faces of the um, uh, the dictators or or the leaders, the former leaders, and then. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the depiction of Native Americans and African Americans in these WPA murals. Um, yeah. Is there ever the so is there ever like a discussion of annotating the original work with maybe you know an accompaniment of of the modern you know response to these works? And so instead of you know altering the piece, just being like, hey, you know, we've grown as a society and we realize this is no longer okay. But we're leaving well, you know, that's a discussion that's been being had right now. I think that's one of the that's one of the responses that people are considering contextualizing. The thing is, I think that um, one of the one aspect of that is that 
one has to consider whether that is a, that is enough for the people who are being depicted that way. Because, you know, I always like to put myself yeah. into that, um, into that uh, thought. What would it be like if my culture, my people, were de being depicted in an offensive way as like, you know, submissive or whatever, and then just somebody put a plaque there to describe it. Would that be okay enough for me? Mm. So that's why I think, and this is one of the things the American Institute of Conservation's um, uh, group that is, is dealing with the response to Confederate monuments is talking about is um, there always has to be people from the offended communities making the decisions about that because otherwise you're really not capturing the moment and the, the meaning of what what needs to be done yeah so yes sure. if a community felt that that was okay yeah and a community yeah. that included members of the offended groups that would be appropriate but that then you know but it's a case-by-case -case thing Absolutely. from an aesthetic standpoint you know those of us who love wpa murals would love to see that, but again, we're not the ones going to pick it that way. I mean, yeah. I'm not. So I do have a, t a question typed in the chat box here. Um, with all that's going on right now, would you recommend that museums take a proactive approach if they contain controversial monuments in their collection, take them off display, cover, hide in some way, changing the interpretation or highlighting the negative history in some way? might be perceived too little too late, which you were kind of talking about a little bit. Uh, many museums seem to be reacting to vandalism rather than being proactive. Um, I agree. I agree very much with the um, with that approach of being proactive and doing something. And if, if, it, if I were a museum director, what I would do is I, and I had a, a publicly displayed thing that was offensive, First of all, I would, if it were me, what I would do is I would convene a panel. Um, first of all, I would cover it just right now. I would cover it. I would hire like an artist like Jory Minaya to just cover it for now. And then I would convene a panel with always preservation professional, conservator, the you know people from the groups that are being targeted by that artwork, and and record the discussion have the discussion be part of the history of the work. Use this as an opportunity. These are all teaching moments. This is why this is why I don't think the best idea is, you know, the middle of the night removal, because then you lose the opportunity for discussion. And if you can be if you can get in front of it, that's so much better. This is a way, this is an opportunity where, you know, um, for change in the best possible way, because the whole idea is not if we if we can get our arms around it and use this to teach ourselves and to and be taught about why certain things are offensive some people might not even understand why certain things are offensive but to learn about it and to understand it and to take it in then public art serves its greatest purpose which is to be a rallying point for social change with with um with the best you know, of us being put forth. Thank you so much. Okay, another question. Um, in Sarasota, we are in the middle of a debate about Seward Johnson's unconditional surrender and whether to remove it from the public art committee to move it to the Shriners who have offered to steward it. Most citizens are furious because they love where it is. Do you have any suggestions to help defer any animosity? Oh, that's a tough one because you're, I understand the issue with that. Um, now, is it being removed because it's there's a political issue with it? I don't think so. I think it's just a big kind of ugly thing. But again, I would imagine other people think differently. Could whoever asked the question? Could you could you respond if it's if the issue of it's being moved is for some type of content problem or is it? Um, um just that people don't like what it looks like um that was leslie butterfield um are you able to unmute yourself
or type it. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not seeing a response. Um, okay, my point is okay. Let's let's if. Oh, she again, they, the, says, the, um, needs to come back. She says due Sorry? to women feeling it's traumatizing and unwanted advance. Got it. Okay. The, the, all right. Okay. So, by the way, I get it. I get that. I get that. It really is, you know, even though it's a beautiful, right, I get that. Um, and I think what needs to happen is more women need to speak out about that because it's, you're right. The, the, the original photograph was an incredible moment in, in American history that, yeah, though it was an unwanted sexual advance, if you will, it was, it was a moment. But to create this big monument and, and a Stuart Johnson of all things, um, I, my suggestion would be if uh, those, you know, you're going to have people that want to keep it. Look, you're going to have people that are going to want to keep the Stonewall Jackson sculpture, but we're, we're beyond that. We're moving past it. So the important thing there is to have a lot of women come out and speak out. So if there's, you know, have women come out and speak out about it. And what's going to happen? Here's the thing. If they don't move it, and you have a lot of people that feel offended by it, they're going to attack it, or they, they're going to attack it in one way or another. And that then will become part of the history of the piece. Okay, thank you. I'm going to unmute everyone. So if you'll mute yourselves, um, but we, we can take a couple more questions. Um, but if you'll mute yourselves afterwards so that we don't hear a lot of background noise, and that way anybody can ask a question. Okay, hopefully that'll work. Anybody else have a question they'd like to ask? Um, Rosa, I wanna thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanna let everyone know um, that we um, have some upcoming programs. I have those on the screen. Um, most of these topics we got from the surveys that we send to you. So um, we will send a follow-up email uh, with a survey. If you'd complete that again, it just takes a couple minutes. Um, and then our website is flamuseums.org. Visit there to see our upcoming programs and to learn more information and register for those. These are all free webinars. Um, that we're offering. <clears throat> um, Rosa, any final comments? All right, we're having an audio issue. Well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you all had a great time today and um, thank you so much for attending.